you know, where does the Permian sit in the global oil equation? You know, where does Diamondback sit in that Permian equation? And, uh, you know, while, like, like you said, we can't control price, but we certainly have to make sure our business is protected against the volatility that we deal with. This new business model where E&Ps are not growing as fast as we used to uh, has become a much safer business model where, you know, the price impacts are really the output of the of the execution machine. And we're not trying to change our plan with every you know $10 move or so in, in oil prices like we used to. So uh, trying to basically take a little volatility out of a very volatile business and recognizing that, you know, macro cycles are inevitable. And, um, you know, the best way to protect yourself is to, you know, make capital allocation decisions quickly when things go south and uh, have a strong balance sheet to survive that inevitable downside. My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is Always Be Building. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. Hope you enjoy the show. Case, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Max, thanks for having me, buddy. It's good to be here. It's not every day that I get a sea uh, level guy from a public company. I've had a few guys come on. A lot of guys just don't want to. So I really appreciate you, uh, you taking the time to do it. I know you're busy, but I know a lot of people want to hear from you. Uh, real quick for maybe anybody that doesn't know who you are, what you're doing, just a little background here to start. Yeah, no, listen, I, I, I'm uh, name's Case Van Tuff, the president and CFO of Diamondback Energy, uh, based in Midland, Texas, of all places. And um, we are the seventh largest independent oil and gas producer by market cap uh, and fourth largest producer in Texas. And uh, I grew up in Southern California, moved to New York City, and uh, now somehow ended up in, in Midland been at Diamondback now for, for six or seven years, and uh, we've had a lot of significant growth, and, um, you know, we're just getting started. So it's, uh, I think, you know, I think, thank you for inviting me. It's a, uh, you know, I think, I think it's a generational thing where this industry, you know, has a lot of younger people that are moving up, and I think this is a good way to communicate and how, you know, I kind of think about, um, you know, telling the Diamondback story and, and talking energy. Absolutely. Well, I wish I would have had this when I was, you know, younger. I didn't have these types of, you know, anything like this to be able to listen to people like yourself talk. And I hope that uh, younger people get some value from it. How did a Southern California guy get into the oil and gas industry? Did you have any background at all growing up around it, or is it just something that your professional not, career led you in it? Yeah, none at none at all. I didn't even know anything about about this business growing up. You know, I I I, I played a little tennis after college, and um, I graduated in 08 and there weren't a ton of jobs. So I, I played tennis after college and then got a job in, in New York uh, doing banking. Um, like many analysts, you know, before me, uh, I tried to get out of there as quickly as possible <laughs> and took the uh, first first job I could get at, at Wexford Capital uh, based in Connecticut. And, and Wexford backed Diamondback. So they're the, the private equity sponsor behind Diamondback. And at the time, you know, I was just a kid that knew how to model. And, uh, and so I worked with our former chairman now, Steve West, who, who, who founded Diamondback to uh, model the business and, and learn the oil and gas business, and then eventually take that business public in, in 2012. And, you know, been fortunate enough to, to, to be part of the company's growth and, and now full time for the last seven years. So didn't know a lot about oil and gas. I, I love it now. I mean, I live and live and breathe it. it. It revolves around everything from geopolitics to regulation to macroeconomics. I mean, it's everywhere. So I, uh, I love this business. It's not without its challenges, but um, I think we're in a good spot as an industry right now. Absolutely. How much do you guys focus on like the macro stuff? I mean, are you, I mean, obviously pricing is a big deal. You've got a lot of different things you got to worry about. This is a complicated business and you can do everything right. And macro tail, you know, headwinds can hit, prices can change. Do you get caught up in that? Do you try to keep your finger on the pulse of it? Or is it more just like focus on what we do operationally and we can't, those things we can't control. Yeah, you you definitely need to have your finger on the pulse of, of the macro and have a, a house view on price. Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't say we try to make every decision based on a house view, but you know, need to know, you know, where does the Permian sit in the global oil equation? You know, where does Diamondback sit in that Permian equation? And uh, you know, while like like you said, we can't control 
price, but we certainly have to make sure our business is protected against the volatility that we deal with. And that, in my mind, means, you know, having hedges, having assets that, you know, are low on the cost curve and having a strong balance sheet. And, you know, generally, and we might get into this later, but, you know, this new business model where E&Ps are not growing as fast as we used to uh, has become a much safer business model where, you know, the price impacts are really the output of the of the execution machine and we're not trying to change our plan with every you know ten dollar move or so in, in oil prices like we used to so uh, trying to basically take a little volatility out of a very volatile business and, and recognizing that you know macro cycles are inevitable and um you know the best way to protect yourself is to you know make capital allocation decisions quickly when things go south and uh, have a strong balance sheet to survive that inevitable down cycle Absolutely. You mentioned it a second ago, you touched on it, but just the way things have changed uh, on the street in terms of what analysts expect, what, you know, shareholders expect, given, talk about that evolution from when you uh, started the company to today, all the different stuff. And I've got some deep dives in a few of these questions later, but just if you had to talk about expectations from shareholders and talk about what the most important ones are in today's environment uh, versus and how that's changed since you've been uh, doing this. Yeah, it's 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 changed a lot. You know, I I, uh, I gave a presentation earlier this week about kind of the history of Diamondback and the history of all the deals we've done. And you look back at some of the investor decks and what what we were selling back then versus now to the street. You know, back then it was all about net asset value. How many locations are you adding? You know, how quickly can you drill them to to drive NAV? And that you know felt kind of natural for a startup. But now that we're a large business, you know, investors want their money back. They want the money back that they gave us to grow. And so they, you know, are pushing the the free cash flow mantra, which is, uh, I think, has resulted in a much healthier sector. Um, you know, like, like I said earlier, there's still going to be cycles. But now, you know, there's still a lot of oil price between where we are and where we start to cut capital. So. You know, investors are focused on free cash flow. It's really moved more towards the financial side of the equation than the technical because the Permian is very well known now. We know the zones. We know kind of a range of outcomes on the asset base. And uh, now it's time to, to drill that asset base up and, and give our shareholders an economic return on their, their investment. Absolutely. When you look at like, uh, I think you mentioned on the earnings call, someone did uh, from your shop about maintaining that capital discipline and trying to hit that forecast around capex you said you know you can't control price but you guys do have some things you can control how difficult is that to do in this inflationary environment and uh, how do you guys manage it right you're trying to you're trying to meet these production targets but at the same time you know we've got a inflationary environment around service costs and around just materials and etc that has been unlike anything we've seen in a long time yeah, it's, it's a battle. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a combination of trusting the team to execute. Um, you know, if, you, if you're if you working between CapEx and, and production and you don't hit production, you're going to have to spend more CapEx to hit those numbers or you're going to have right. to miss production. And you kind of have to, you know, we've been fortunate over the last couple of years to hit both CapEx and production, even though we had a hyperinflationary environment last year. But I also think it's about managing expectations with the street, right? You know, this this business is not it's not easy to drill two miles down and two miles out 330 times in a year under budget. And, you know, we got to make sure we don't give the street and give our investors the best possible outcome because, you know, sometimes things happen. Right. And so we need to make sure we message appropriately, but also have faith in the uh, in the execution teams. And, and you know, quite frankly, you know, my job is made a lot easier because we have the best guys in the business on the drilling side. You know, they they are very hyper focused on cost and everyone's incentivized across the organization to be very cost conscious. And that that's kind of Diamondback's MO has always been low cost operator and, and I don't see that that changing anytime soon. Back in early in my career, I worked at Chesapeake Energy and I spent some time, I did a stint, mostly I've been in the commercial marketing midstream side, but working for producers. But towards the end when I was there, I made a move over to the financial strategy and planning group. And I remember how hard it was to come up with all these metrics and things and try to figure out from the data what was actually happening. I and mean, at the time, that company was growing so fast and had so many assets. Let's talk about your guys' process on 
strategy and, you know, internally the data that you guys have and how you incorporate that uh, and tie it to the strategy. And when you're getting ready for these earnings calls, um, what's that process like? And how do you, you know, refine it to the point to where you can hit these numbers? Because if you don't have a, you know, garbage in, garbage out on the data and uh, right. so how do you manage all that? Yeah, look, our data has gotten incredibly uh, so much better since, you know, really since we did the Energen deal, you know, back we bought Energen in 2018, you know, we were kind of the low cost operator, hungry operator. We didn't have all the systems in place because we were kind of a, a startup that had, had gotten big quickly. What Energen brought and what some of those people brought are, you know, systems and a planning process that was a lot more refined than what we had. And so now the combination of those two means that, you know, I can see the plan. We basically go through it every week with the exec, you know, at the exec meetings. How many lateral feet have we completed this year? What's the budget? How many producing days for these new wells have we hit versus budget? And then, you know, during the quarter. So, so you're basically keeping tabs on how you're doing, you know, real time throughout the quarter. And then what has also helped is that every quarter we review not only every well cost from the prior from the prior quarter, where it costs trending, where things heading, but also the well performance from every quarter. So our our well performance data has has gotten so much better. You compare that to type curve, compare that to plan, and really, you know, I, I would I like to call say that those guys can help us see around corners where, you know, without that group and the planning group and the process there, you know, I would know that there's a you know, uh, somewhere we need to move production around in, in Q3 or Q4. Like right now we're planning Q3, Q4 because the plan for Q1 and Q2 is pretty set. You know, right. shale, I like to say, has has become a uh, a longer cycle business than it used to be. We used to be able to just go get a location and go get it and then we could hit volumes. But when you're completing 20 well pads, you better be ahead of your plan and know what's coming down the pipe. What are like those red flags? Like if you look at something, what are some of these key metrics you mentioned, you know, what, how much you're drilling, where the costs are at, but if you, what are kind of the key things you're looking at in these weeklies where you're like, uh Oh, I need to dive into this. Is it just everything? Or is there certain things that are like your trigger items where you're like, I'm super focused on these like key things that I'm going to watch just in case, you know, yeah. Something pops up. Yeah. Pr I would say the most important is production, right? Daily production. Right. What does daily downtime look like? I mean, you know, you a company like Diamondback today producing, you know, three over 300,000 barrels a day of gross production at any given time, we have between 20 and 30,000 barrels down, right. For different reasons, which is just natural. And we, we forecast that we model it. But if one of those line items like infrastructure or electrical or, uh, you know, shut in for frack is, is sticking out, that's when you say, Hey, what, what is actually going on here versus our expectations? And, you know, again, going back to that planning group, like we know when big pads are going to be shut in for frack. So we can model where those frack kits are going to be and move our completion crews to make up for those lost volumes during that time period. So that, that forward looking process, you know, ties to seeing the daily production and the, uh, you know, the downtime across the organization. Yeah, that's good. Never want to be waiting on infrastructure that was always my thing whenever i worked in that no. group uh it was always like is the pipeline going to be there you know we've got these coming online i had a used to have nightmares of like thinking that i missed <laughs> uh, a line on the rig schedule and they'd be like where is this pipeline and i'd be you know in a meeting like scared that uh <laughs> i didn't have a oh yeah for, and, and it starts for the volume you know, for, yeah for you know fortunately we're in the permian right which has the best infrastructure in the country so there there are always you know, workarounds in, in some form or fashion, but, but it is, like I said, you know, we're staking, we're th planning right away. We're planning pad sites, you know, two, three years in advance now versus, uh, you know, in 2017, when I started, we could just put a, a two or three well pad wherever we wanted and, uh, and, and make a quarter. It's a little different now that we produce, you know, 430,000 BOEs net a day. It's, uh, if you, if you miss a big frack date, you're, uh, you're in trouble. I had this for later on, but since we're kind of already on it, let's talk about the infrastructure side. Um, midstream wise, I know you guys own some assets and are integrated. Uh, I know you do a lot of stuff on the water infrastructure side, but just give the, uh, talk about the strategy there, how you guys view getting these critical infrastructure pieces in place and what are the different ways that you're tackling that? Yeah, I think the strategy is twofold. I think the, the primary 
goal for infrastructure is to not rely on the third party to make sure we hit all these dates and all these targets like I'm like I'm talking to you about, right? So the biggest piece of that is on the water side. You know, we move a million barrels of produced water a day across the wow. portfolio, which is, you know, it's 3x the the oil volume. So, I, you know, I like to say that the hardest thing we do is is manage water volumes throughout the organization. And when you're running, you know, four simul frac frac crews, you need to source over 300,000 barrels a day of water too. So, you know, that infrastructure piece, we really like to rely on ourselves to make sure it's built out. It hits, you know, it, it goes to the spots we need it to go to. And then downstream, you know, it's more about the commercial protection, right? It's about making sure your barrels move to the biggest market, most liquid markets. And, and we've done that on the oil side by investing in the pipelines while also signing the commercial agreement associated with that. So we're kind of incentivizing development and also getting an economic return for protecting ourselves commercially. So I'd kind of say that, that those are two buckets, but midstream has, has been very important to us, very important to our cost structure. And, uh, you know, some of these uh, non-op uh, midstream assets we've monetized, we just monetized the uh, gray oak pipeline. But again, we retain all of our commercial aspects of it. And, uh, you know, from an economic perspective, it was a good economic return. Yeah, that's good. Well, that's like what our company does. We give advice to folks and we, we actually market product uh, physically purchase, buy and sell. But we also consult for a lot of smaller and mid-sized guys that just don't have the expertise in house. And I think it's smart what you guys are doing and taking the ownership in it. You know, my thing has always been like, if you're going to pay for this, especially if you're making commitments, uh, it just makes a lot of sense uh, to have an ownership stake. And then to your point, um, you can maybe monetize it later on. Um, you know, talk about maybe can you trade these assets potentially for a good multiple in the future, how those trade and is that part of the strategy as well, if you need to? Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? You, if you're going to drive production growth on the system and create value for the system, why not own a piece of the system and then at the right time monetize that value? So that, that you know, midstream assets trade better than E&P for a reason, right? They're their volume, they have volume risk, but they don't have the price risk that we have. And, you know, so generally, you know, at the right time, I think it makes sense to sell appropriate midstream assets at, at higher multiples than we're trading at. And that's kind of exactly what we did at, on Gray Oak. You know, we, we, we sold it for, you know, almost double the multiple that Diamondback trades at today and uh, can use that cash to, uh, you know, to drill more wells or return more cash to, to shareholders. What about uh, on the downstream side, you mentioned oil, what about gas and just some of the bottlenecks that are potentially cropping up in the, on the gas side, what's happening with Waha? And then to follow up on that, are you guys trying to do anything where you get a little further downstream, maybe get some exposure on the LNG side or to any of those world markets, uh, but just your thoughts on gas takeaway? Yeah, I, I think gas takeaway has always been an issue in the Permian because the gas type curves continue to outperform expectations, right? The, the basin's getting a little gassier. But not, not just that, you know, gas always exceeds expectations and, you know, the oil volumes are what drive economics in the Permian, but we have to solve gas takeaway in the basin. Now, I think there's projects that are coming and there's probably more projects that need to need to be announced uh, to get us through the rest of this decade for gas growth. Uh, what we've tried to do is, is, you know, put our money where our mouth is wherever we can. Um, unfortunately, you know, because we've been so acquisitive through you know, buying private equity backed deals or other, you know, other companies, most times, whatever we buy comes with contracts associated with it. And so we're kind of trying to live within those, those boundaries. But you know, we have done a few things. We invested in WTG, which is a gas gathering processor in the basin, got two, 200 million a day cryos built immediately to support our growth. You know, we, we contributed some volumes to a long haul pipeline, Whistler pipeline to go to Gulf Coast. And so we're doing what we can in, in the basin, but, you know, we need a little bit of support from our midstream partners, you know, and, and then, you know, as you go down downstream, you know, I, I think the LNG opportunity is real. I think obviously U.S. LNG has a great story behind it. You know, the, the debate at Diamondback is, you know, as an oil producer, is it really worth signing a 15 year deal on your yeah. balance sheet, take or pay to make, you know, to get molecules across the dock when you know i think you know if you have a 
if you can get the molecules there and there's enough LNG capacity in the U.S., then that should mean U.S. and international gas prices, you know, converge a bit versus like what we've seen over the last year where Europe's short, you know, gas, U.S. is long gas, we don't have enough LNG capacity. So if we build that capacity out, hopefully that's de-bottlenecked and, and we can participate in a, a, a higher U.S. gas price um, without, you know, putting a 15-year liability on the balance sheet. But yeah. never say never. I, you know, that's just kind of the debate internally right now on LNG. I think these deals will get get built, but um, it's a big uh, it's a big expense, take or pay, which also means being big has its advantages to signing those kinds of deals. It's always a tough problem. I mean, you <clears throat> we dealt with it a lot back at the Chesapeake days. They had way, t I would say, too many, quite frankly, commitments, but that's mm -hmm. how they wanted to do it. And, you know, when things are blown and going and prices are supportive, it's great. When they're not, it can become a, a burden and you can lose some flexibility, I think is a big thing. It's like, okay, now I feel like this obligation because I've created this liability and we, you know, maybe you lose the ability to throttle down on activity levels uh, right. that you would have otherwise had, right? Which is, there's a premium. Uh, yeah, that. so that's, that's why I think it could make sense for a piece of our business, right? Um, I wouldn't commit our whole business to it. And, and again, like, like you said, you have to be big enough to be able to eat, you know, some contracts or eat, you know, some, some time periods where commodity prices are weak or we're cycling down. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the question. I hate being asked, um, gas prices. People are always like, ask me what, what I think, where they're going to go. My typical response is like, I'm going to be wrong. And if I knew where they were going to go, <laughs> I'd be like on an Island somewhere, but this precipitous drop just recently, you know, I, I felt like $9 was fake. I kind of feel like $2 is fake too. I just, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I believe the floor should be higher for longer. Um, yeah. But you guys recently on this drop, you know, you're getting probably a lot of Intel. You guys probably have macro experts, but just your thoughts on this recent drop. Did you guys have any, inclina any inclination beforehand that maybe we could be heading for some choppy waters or just uh, any thoughts on price action recently? I wish, man, or I'd be on a beach with you too. But, <laughs> you know, I... I I, you know, I, I think our work told us that that you needed more LNG to get built for U.S. gas to be less volatile. I, I, I didn't think it would happen this quickly, but, uh, you know, Mother Nature had a different story for this winter where, you know, it's just been a very warm winter and gas has just been clobbered. I, I fully agree with you that, you know, $2 isn't real and $9 felt a little a little rich. Um but, you know, I think we always thought gas was going to be a little tight in 23 and 24 in the U.S., knowing that, you know, you're constrained here, right? Because you can't, if the gas can't get on a ship, there's only so much local demand. And that means, you know, storage is going up. So I, I guess I, I'm in the consensus that I'm long-term bullish gas. But, um, you know, I, I think generally the market will sort itself out here at, at $2 to, to lower some activity and get prices back up. Yeah, I agree. It just seems like we're in a more volatile spot than we were the last 10 years, kind of range bound. People would tell me stories. And I've been in the industry for about 13 years and they'd be like, you know, it used to be super volatile and the traders would have a bigger say on this price swings. And then we were just kind of in this sort of flat kind of range bound period. And it seems like we're maybe going back to that volatility. Um, shifting yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Shifting a little bit to like the cost side, uh, just drilling, you know, service costs and like, Rig rates, I mean, I know you guys probably have a lot of your stuff contracted, but just thoughts on where, you know, drilling rates might go on the spot market, uh, just thoughts on service costs in general. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, 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 last year we like to say that every single line item went up on the AFE, right? There was nowhere to hide. Um, I think this year that's going to change a little. There's probably some things that are going to come our way. Um, you know, I like to I like to say that, you know, when – when land drillers start uh, press releasing contracts, that usually means that contracts are getting kind of, kind of toppy. And you saw a few of those in the, in the fall of last year, you know, we try to keep everything kind of rolling six months. So we have 15 rigs going today, all of them on, you know, kind of three to six month deals. And that allows us to, you know, cycle up or cycle down, like you said, but also have the flexibility to drop them if we needed to. And, um, you know, I think on the frac side, we have, um, you know, for what they're called simulfrac uh, crews with Halliburton, two of them which are, are electric. So those those will be on 
longer term contracts. So we're kind of less exposed to the spot market, positive or negative. But, you know, generally these these trends on service costs follow the rig count. And I haven't seen rig count, you know, do much in the last few mm-hmm. months. And that, that kind of means things are leveling off here. Um, and hopefully, you know, every line item doesn't go up again like it did uh, in 2022. Yeah, definitely. What about uh, switching more to the financial stuff, kind of balance sheet, how you guys feel where you're at, how you're viewing debt in this environment, uh, and then talk about some of the initiatives to return cash to shareholders. Yeah, you know, listen, balance sheet's improved a lot since um, since COVID. Um, you know, I I, uh, I think two things matter on on balance sheet. You know, leverage on a on a debt to EBITDA basis is obviously important, but EBITDA we know can get cut in half immediately, right? So you need to have free cash flow to cover your cover your debt on top of on top of just EBITDA. And two, I think duration matters. You know, we we're fortunate that we're uh, investment grade. And so we can raise 10 and 30 year notes where, you know, right now we don't have a maturity due before 2026. So I'd love to take that maturity out, but we can be patient and build cash to the point where it makes sense to, to remove that. And then our next maturity is not due till 2029. So, you know, absolute debt's important, but also knowing how cyclical this business is, you don't want to go into a down cycle with, you know, three maturities stacked back to back to back because that that puts some strain on the organization. So that's how we're thinking about the balance sheet. Cost of debt's obviously gone up significantly, right? You know, obviously with the Fed raising rates, you know, we did a bond deal last fall, 10 year deal at six and a quarter percent, which was kind of an eye popping number considering that our last 10 year deal was done at three and a quarter percent. But that's just yeah. the, the nature of the beast with the Fed Fed raising. It probably means oil companies should you know, keep a little more cash on their balance sheet uh, on the debt side. And then, you know, the, the big debate coming out of this down cycle has been that equity return plan, right? What's your capital return plan? How is it structured? How do I know that I'm getting my money back as an investor, right? And, and for us, the base dividend has always been, you know, most important. You know, we've also committed to return 75% of our free cash flow back to equity holders. So basically, 75% goes to equity, 20, 25% goes to the balance sheet or towards acquisitions. And, um, you know, the only real flexibility we have in that 75% is that, you know, we can allocate between a buyback and a variable dividend. I like to say that, you know, if we get the chance to buy back, we will throughout the quarter. But if we don't spend 75% of our free cash flow on buying back shares plus the base dividend, then we will make you whole with a, uh, a variable, which has been you know, kind of the case here for the last last three or four quarters. You know, there might be a day when things cycle down where we just spend all of our money on buybacks because that's going to be the best use of capital, um, you know, for, for the business at the time. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, just your <clears throat> impression of uh, the valuation the street's giving, not just to you, but industry-wise, and I've heard this from some others, it's like, if we're not going to be rewarded for certain things and we're only going to be rewarded for other things, then things like these share buybacks make a lot of sense, but just, uh, I, mean, I think if I had to ask you whether your stock price is high enough, you'd say it wasn't, but just the, just the, uh, just, Always, your thoughts on, Max, come on. Yeah, right. <laughs> just, uh, how the streets treating, uh, you in the industry. Well, I, I'll, I'll kind of try to take the positive view there because I know everyone always thinks their stocks, you know, cheap and that's, that's our job, right? There's always upside. There's always things we're doing to try to improve value. I think what's fortunate for the ENPs and, you know, more so on the oil EMPs, you know, maybe less so on the gas guys with the, with the, you know, pullback is that, you know, you've really actually seen multiple expansion for the first time in, in, you know, probably my career over the last, you know, six to nine months, right? You had yeah. oil at a hundred in the summer, Diamondback stock was at 120 bucks, 125 bucks a share. Oil's down 30%, right? We're down to 75, 70 from there and stocks flat to up. Mm. You know, that that's actually a positive sign that you have real investors stepping in on on down on down days, uh, buying dips and believing in, you know, more of the long-term value proposition. And also I think it's generally, you know, the strip has kind of even, you know, flattened out a little bit and that has resulted in, you know, investors getting confidence that the mid-cycle price is not 
fifty dollars a barrel anymore like it has been the last ten years. So um, I'm going to take the positive side of that. There's there's obviously sure. you know it's, it, it, there's obviously in my in my mind a short shortness of barrels across the world. I think that was kind of masked by the SPR last year, and we'll see you know where um, where things shake out on on price as the year unfolds. Absolutely. That's good. Good answer. Uh, talk about some of these acquisitions you guys did last year. If you want to talk about them in specific, you can, or just more broadly from a strategic standpoint, why you liked them, but uh, talk about uh, some of the acquisition side. Yeah. I, you know, we did two, we announced two deals in the fall, uh, Firebird and Lario. And, and I, I like to say that, you know, combined those two deals, we basically bought a small cap public company without all of the issues associated with a public to public transaction, you know, on, on both deals, you had a significant amount of free cash flow, significant amount of cash flow. Lario probably had, uh, you know, more tier one rock as everyone defined it in the basin, but, but less inventory and firebird was kind of our, uh, in our backyard, they've been testing the basin further West than others have. And we, you know, hopped on it before a lot of results were made public. So, you know, combined, I think they extend inventory duration, you know, they check the financial accretion boxes and, um, you know, generally those deals are easier to finance and talk to the market about than a public deal because you're not comparing public to public numbers. And so, um, you know, both good deals, sellers, you know, I think we're seeing that, that their well costs were going up and ours were going up less and, it might made sense to, to turn the asset over into, into our hands. Well, you kind of led where I was going with the next question. You've kind of answered it already, but I got a buddy, Josh Young on Twitter that runs a hedge fund. He's really into the small caps. Uh, we were talking earlier today and I mentioned I was interviewing you and he was like, ask about, you know, the logic behind going after some of these privates uh, that he maybe perceives as a little bit pricier potentially versus some of the small caps in the public domain that uh, maybe are, a cheaper, a cheaper buy, but you gave some of the reasons, but just any thoughts there? Yeah, listen, I, I think it's, um, I think it's control is important. I think it's messaging is important. And I think, um, you know, I, I think quality of inventory and depth of inventory are also mm. important, right? So, you know, we run deals on, on NAV. That's how we're always going to run deals. And the multiples in my mind <laughs> are kind of the output <clears throat> of that NAV, you know, it, it's important that something's accretive from a financial perspective, but I also think generally if you're not buying something that competes for capital with your existing asset base and extends inventory duration, then I think, you know, you have to think about how and why that deal, you know, in particular makes sense. But, you know, we, we bought a lot of things over the last, over the last 10 years, two, two public deals, you know, mostly private deals, but generally, you know, in a private deal, you have more of a motivated seller than you do on, on the public side. Yeah. Broad thoughts on the M and A market. Uh, doesn't have to be just Permian, but just the stuff that you see getting done. I mean, you talked about what you guys have done. <clears throat> you've bought some things, you sold some things, but just like bid asks and you know how much is getting done and how much the volatility is impacting things. But just kind of your general, like a general riff on M and A and what what you what the market looks like to you right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think consolidation has happened in the bit in the in the business. There's a lot less tickers on the board. I think consolidation has worked and been a, a nice tool for companies like Diamondback to utilize. Um, right now, I, you know, I think the volatility on the oil side is, is has subsided and that's kind of gotten some bid asks narrowed. Obviously, you know, you've seen what happened on gas. We've talked about that. You know, I think that kind of volatility hurts M&A, right? And, and that's kind of probably why in, in the oil land, you saw less in kind of Q1, Q2 of last year where you know, prices were spiking and yeah. on the inverse, you're seeing the same on the gas side. So stability helps a lot. Um, you know, we've dealt with a lot of volatility on the oil side in the last year, but less so in the last six months, that's kind of brought uh, a few deals uh, across the finish line, including our, including ours. Absolutely. What about uh, just divesting of anything you guys on the earnings call mentioned, maybe some non-core stuff, just thoughts on, is it a good time to sell? if it, you know, the deal's got to make sense or just your thoughts on any shedding of any assets? Yeah, we, we, we announced two deals, um, E&P deals uh, with earnings, one of them in Glasscock County, uh, right behind me in the map, um, Eastern Glasscock County, you know, an area that 
you know, is good rock, but doesn't compete for capital today uh, in our portfolio. And, you know, the buyer paid for, you know, development because they're going to put a rig or two on it right away. So th those are kind of the deals that I think are happening. Um, I think it's probably, it'd probably be hard, Max, to sell something of significant size, just mm -hmm. given the, the buyer universe. But this, you know, this is a $350 million deal that, um, you know, they can put a little financing on it and get some equity and, and drill some wells. Um, and that, that seems to be, you know, private equity is moving more towards operating and drilling versus the buy and flip model of the, of the past. Yeah. And, uh, switch shifting gears a little bit. Inverus has been rumbling and some others have been rumbling, uh, people on Twitter as well about just well productivity in the Permian. And mm -hmm. then you had this Devin, uh, Devin news and they had got, took a bit of a hit. Uh, just your guys' thoughts on managing the productivity side, things like parent child, just how you guys view it and make sure you're being the most efficient you can be in any challenges uh, looming in the, in the future, uh, just on productivity from these wells. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll kind of take a trip down, down memory lane in, in 2018 and 2019 um, in the gr gr drill baby drill days, you know, we, we had a, a tough quarter Q3 of 19 um, combination of, you know, missing production that quarter, but also kind of implying that the next year wasn't going to be as, as good. And the result of that, you know, was, you know, our work internally looking at, you know, these, these parent wells and coming in and drilling the child next to it, you know, it wasn't the best results, right? So we, we, we made the decision, the conscious, conscious decision at the time to, you know, begin a co-development strategy, um, develop all the economic zones that you can at once. I um, mean, you know, that probably hurts your, you know, your highest IRR well, but as a pad, you know, it's, it generates more NPV per section than, um, you know, if you drilled a bunch of parent wells and then tried to come back and drill ch ch children after that. So, you know, we took our medicine. That was a tough, tough day. I think the stock was down like 13%. Um, mm -hmm. Not like I remember it, but, um, you know, we've come out of that developing large pads in the Midland Basin with, you know, three, four, five zones at the same time. And, you know, it doesn't completely... Uh, mitigate parent child, but it certainly helps a lot. And, you know, that's why when we look at things now and look at development plan, it's on a pad level basis rather than an individual well IRR, right? Because Wolf Camp Bay might be amazing, but if you come back and try to get the lower sprayberry three years later, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be drained versus what, you know, what initial expectations were. So it's a, it's an industry issue. I think we have some of the best scientists in the in the business on our team and others and you know more more wells together at the same time has just been uh, a, a a boon for diamondback and we put it in our deck uh this quarter where you know 20 2022 midland productivity was back to 2017 2018 levels which were kind of the the best years that we had in company history so we got a little bit of runway there which which i think will be uh beneficial to, to us and diamondback shareholders but and taking that medicine and, and learning from co-development early has is paying dividends today. It's a good answer. How do you think about uh, inventory broadly with what you got? And then uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but just like life outside or maybe a future beyond the Permian at all. Any thoughts around where you guys would want to be or if you ever thought about it or uh, maybe answer the inventory one first and then just kind of a, is there ever a thought of life outside the Permian? Yeah, well, I, you know, listen, inventory is precious. It's precious for everybody. I don't care you know, how big you are, or how small you are. It's, it's precious, particularly the right inventory. Right. And that's why I think we've we've done a couple, you know, well-timed deals, QEP and Guide On coming out of the depths of COVID. We announced those deals at the same time, uh, right right before Christmas. You know, did the two deals last some last uh, fall, and you know, like I said, those deals need to extend your inventory duration rather than you know, drill them up right away. So I, I think, you know, that model's worked for us. Um, I think that model um, is a model to follow. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, we're definitely not in the first inning of shale anymore. I, you know, we've been left for dead <laughs> yeah. many times, but have come back many times. Um, I, I do think though, you know, obviously the tier one areas are very well known. We kind of know who has what in those areas. And, you know, we're very fortunate to have what we have um, where I think our our plan is, you know, differential, right? I, I like to say that the shell cost, cost curve is going up, right? It's going like this. 
we got to make sure our asset base and our cost structure make sure we stay like this because you know we're not going to be able to drill uh you know the same quality wells as we're drilling this year forever we just need to make sure we do it longer than than most yeah and then you know other basins you know that this is home like we we know this area so well like the back of our hand i like to say you know my number one rule is know what you don't know and while Mm. i know a little bit about the other basins to be dangerous you know this is this is our expertise where we can find a deal like firebird where you know no one else would even you know that was a not even a marketed deal right we we just talked to those guys and figured it out and that's kind of kind of been our our bread and butter it's so easy to like extrapolate current trends out over perpetuity like the idea that gas growth can happen forever and then you look at what's going on in the northeast with like infrastructure constraints although gas supply has been setting records but you kind of get into these modes i feel like in my career and this is why that question is pretty fascinating to me is that thinking about you know okay here's where we are today I'm a relatively young guy. I still got, you know, a couple decades, hopefully uh, plugging away in this industry, but it's just like, where does it go? You know, I mean, we just, like you said, it's not the early innings probably anymore, but um, it's just fascinating to me to think about the evolution into the future. I mean, clearly consolidation has been, uh, has been the movement recently, which I think has been good. Quite frankly, it needed right. to happen. Uh, needed so to I don't happen. know. It's just an interesting question. What about a? Uh, well, I I just know yeah. that I, I know I know one thing. You know, two things. I know you know I'm going to be around a long time too, and and I know this industry has reinvented <laughs> itself in a significant way, probably every four or five years over the last fifteen years, right? And um, I think generally, you know, there's a lot that can be done from a science perspective on this resource. We're still only, you know, we're covering, you know, gig. Ask a geologist, they'll tell you eight, nine, 10, 15 percent of the oil in place. You know, there's still a lot left to do and, and a lot of smart people looking at it. So, you know, I, I'm planning on being around as long as you and uh, we'll throw our retirement party together. But we've got a, <laughs> a, a long way to go in this in this sector. Absolutely. Speaking about re- reinventing yourselves, the industry with all the ESG pressures and companies being, you know, looked at through a different lens now. Uh, from shareholders and from uh, the public sentiment just speak to some of the stuff you guys are doing on that front uh just what your initiatives are and how you think about doing it in a practical way uh, within you know the core business of what you do yeah I, it kind of goes to the no you don't know business right like we're <clears throat> we're heavily focused on decarbonizing our production right in all former forms of fashion or fashions so that means reducing scope one intensity by 50 percent by 2024 getting we got to get methane out of the air. We're going to, you know, reduce our methane intensity by 70% over mm. five years from 19 to 24. And, um, you know, that, that's just the starting point, right? What, where can we go beyond that? You know, what's unique about Diamondback is we are, you know, the first E&P that I know of that, that bought carbon credits to offset the rest of our scope on emissions, kind of send a message to the market that, Hey, we're not going to set goals to buy target, buy credits to hit our goals, but, while we hit these goals we're going to have a cost and that cost is you know buying credits to offset our scope one emissions um you know on top of that i think investors have done a great job pushing us and we've done a great job learning you know about our carbon footprint and how we can tackle it you know there's five years ago i didn't know what a scope one emission was now we have a page in our deck that breaks out you know pie chart by source where it's coming from and how we're tackling each of those items. So um, in, this is an industry issue. I think generally, you know, if you got the 10 top CEOs in the business together in a room, they'd all, you know, not share anything when it comes to development plans or acquisition targets, but when it comes to environmental, they, they share everything. And that I think has been a unique um, outcome of the, the environmental movement, you know, improving the carbon footprint of us producers. Yeah. And the barrels here are so clean and the MCFs are so clean comparatively to, if that's, you know, the word you want to use, but comparatively to the, you know, the metrics that they base it on uh, versus around the world. Right. And so right. it's, it's a, uh, it's a problem that I think is solvable. What would your response be? And you touched on it with the methane emissions. You know, if you get into a Twitter argument with somebody, if you say natural gas is, uh, is this path forward where we can reduce a lot of emissions, people want to throw up methane leaks, but I, I think it's a solvable problem. Um, what are your thoughts on methane leaks and what are you guys doing? 
Yeah, I think it's a totally a solvable problem. I mean, two years ago, right, we used to do flyovers, right? So we did flyovers. Let's call it every 90 days or 180 days, we'd fly fly a drone or fly a plane over all of the batteries and, and you could sense methane and detect where it is. Today, we have uh, almost 90% of our production under some form of continuous methane monitoring. And what that is, is basically radar around each facility that can sniff methane out of the air. And when there is methane in the air, or there is a leak, an alarm bell goes off. And we have a team of, you know, 15 or 20 guys in the field that their sole job is just to go fix methane leaks. And, you know, that, that I think is a, a change in operating philosophy versus where we were before. So, you know, I know that that technology is not perfect, but if you can stop a methane leak in a day rather than, hey, you do a flyover and the leak happens the next day and you don't catch it for 90 days, you know, we're doing a lot better um, than, than we were in the past. Uh, again, you know, the EDF and people who think they're our friends, but they, you know, they're, they're not, like they don't see that we're making the progress that, that we're making. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of have a goal I, maybe it's a personal goal. Maybe it's a, a diamondback goal to basically say, you know, how do you make a Permian barrel or a Permian molecule, you know, free of any pushback from regulators on how we're operating this business in an environmentally friendly, friendly way. Now, there's always going to still be people that, that hate the industry, but a rational mind might look at it and say, wow, these companies are actually doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, and rational and nuanced conversations are important to, for people that are willing to learn and want to learn about what you guys are doing. I think that, you know, these types of <clears throat> long form discussions, they can, they can get educated on it. And there is a lot that the industry is doing and people want to hate on the oil and gas industry, but man, we've, we're under the most scrutiny of anybody. Um, yeah, especially we... like, you know, I mean, locally, certainly on local environmental stuff, we're under a ton of scrutiny and now we're under a ton of scrutiny around climate and, and atmospheric and all these other things too, that are a little bit more nebulous, but we're taking active steps to, to combat it. So, um, I don't know if the same could be said about OPEC and some of these other countries. Yeah. So they don't care. Do, they don't, they right. don't know what their scope. I mean, some of them, you know, do, but so, most of them don't care what their scope on emissions are. I mean, there's a hole in the ground in Turkmenistan that's been burning for 30 years. It's just burning. Right. It's a giant flare. Uh, you know, I mean, I, they don't care. So, yeah. you know, I, but, but at the end of the day, we operate in the U S and we have to have a different operating philosophy here. I just, um, you know, I just hope we get the credit as an industry that is, should be coming our way. Yeah, absolutely. Shifting gears to just more, uh, you know, leadership and management, being in a public company, how you've changed and evolved and learned to become, you know, where you are today. I mean, it's a different skill set being at the C-suite in terms of like, you got to manage a lot of people, you've got personnel, um, a lot of challenges with it, just some of the things around just leadership and, you know, being a manager and how you've uh, evolved over the years. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a lot different from the, the hedge fund days, right? I mean, in, when yeah. you're at a hedge fund or private equity fund, you're, you're focused on your model and your business plan and what Excel tells you. And, and now I like to say that, you know, my job is to make Excel turn into to real life. And, um, you know, as, as you move up, it, it, it does involve a lot more people, uh, you know, person to person interaction, a lot more, um, I won't call it training, but, you know, pushing things that you used to do yourself to your team. Um, you know, for me in a town like Midland, it's become a lot more community involvement, um, you know, government relations involvement, external facing things that, you know, you never really thought about, uh, you know, coming in as a VP of corporate development or whatever, you know, I, I was just kind of the deal guy at the beginning and, and moved up and, you know, now, um, you know, I, I deal with everything from HR to government affairs, but, uh, you know, that's part of the job and, and, um, you know, it's just something you, you, you learn, like you learn how to deal with public speaking, you learn how to deal with investors and, um, you know, influence, influence people to, to execute for you. Yeah, for sure. What about the stress? with being graded quarterly, um, just having that on you all the time, the stress of working probably long hours, I assume the work life balance stuff. How do you handle, uh, how do you handle that? Yeah. I, you know, the, the quarterly clock is something we've always dealt with. So, you know, we're, we're pretty used to it. I, I would say generally because of that data analytics that I talked to you about at the beginning, 
I feel so much more comfortable about where we sit in a quarter. Like today, here we are, you know, February 20th, you know, 50 days into a quarter, you have a pretty good idea how things are going. So, um, you know, the 90 day clock doesn't, doesn't bother me. I, I like talking to investors. They're all extremely smart. I usually learn a lot from them. Um, you know, I, I would say hours wise and, and stress wise, it's a very stressful, you know, 8.30 to 5.30 and you're always on call back to back to back. But, you know, I try not to take that home with me. I have a 15 month old daughter now and, and awesome. you know, I try to see her in the morning and, and try to, you know, see her at night and get home. I'm really home before her bedtime, right? So um, when I was working at City, man, 20 hour, 18 hour days every day, yeah. that was a uh, that was a lot more hours than it is now, but I would say now you have a lot more stress because you're, you know, in a, in a thousand person organization. Oh, that's good. Hey, those things are important. I've got three little kids and I try, man, it's the work. I struggle with the work-life balance. Um, I do a lot of things like this that are, my wife considers work. I consider it fun, having good yeah. conversations with interesting people and try, try to push myself uh, with a bunch of different ventures that we have going on, but it's just, you got to try to stay grounded what uh what advice would you give that's the question i try to ask everybody what advice would you give your younger version of yourself um knowing what you know now living the experiences that you've had if you could go back and talk to that 20 something year old version uh what would you what would you tell them uh you know i i would say don't don't stress out like let things come to you a little bit right you know you're always you're so eager and hungry as a as a 22 23 year old coming out of college you know you want to be you want to move up, you want to get that promotion, you want to go, you know, but, but at the end of the day, if you do all the right things, you know, things are going to, going to come to you. And, you know, one of the other things I always tell people is, is to stay open minded, right? Like I, I didn't know what the Permian Basin was. I didn't know what, you know, what a type curve was, you know, coming out of, out of banking, but, you know, I, I seized that opportunity and, you know, thank God I, I did it. Cause this is a, a great place to work and, and a great place to live. Yeah. How do you, uh, these, sorry, these are kind of just more for me, the ones that I like to ask, but how do you define success? Like, when do you feel satisfied? That's another trap that I feel like I can get into. Sometimes you set these goals and then like, by the time you're at it, you're kind of already setting the next one, but just your thoughts about success and, uh, achieving the things you want to achieve. Listen, I, I think that's kind of the output. Um, you know, I, I would like to, I like to say that you know, when I moved back to Diamondback full time, I was running a drilling company for five years before that. And while I, I learned a lot in about people and managing people running a drilling company, I probably wasn't as mentally challenged as, as I was at Diamondback. So, you know, being getting back to learning and pushing yourself mentally for me was a, a, a the best reward about this this company and this position. And I would say the success and promotions and all that stuff was kind of the output of you know wanting to work hard every day um you know it's it's cliche but but when you're when you're enjoying what you do the day flies by and that that that's has happened to me over the last seven years here nothing that's a great answer no when you are enjoying what you do it does go by quick um what about this stuff going on in midland i know you're trying to be active in the community i saw you're upset and some other people at the organization <laughs> around this park this park project that got shut down and just your thoughts around what Midland could be doing, should be doing. You have, you're raising a family now in this community. What are you guys trying to do to better the community? And just like in a perfect world, where would you see Midland moving um, to, to better the community? Yeah, a great, great question and very topical. I mean, I, I would say my perspective has changed significantly after having a kid, right? Because you're starting to think about education, where are they going to go to school? What, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? What activities are they going to do? And, um, you know, Midland is, is a is a great town, but Midland also has a significant amount of issues with respect to um, its funding sources. You know, a lot of money that is made here um, goes to the state and doesn't come back. And mm. on top of that, you have a, a, a population that is extremely conservative, which is, a you know, a good thing. But uh, I, I don't agree with, you know, being so conservative on your property taxes to the point that the city has no money to pay cops and firefighters mm. and, you know, grow the things necessary to, you know, support a community that's growing GDP, you know, eight, 10% a year, right? Like, yeah, this place is growing like a weed. 
we need to invest in ourselves. And, and unfortunately, you know, when people say invest in yourself in Midland, they think taxes, and that doesn't have to be the answer. Um, and so this, you know, this particular park issue, um, what frustrated me the most about it is that there was $40 million of charity that had been, that had been raised to go into the reconstruction of Hogan Park. $40 million. The city doesn't have $40 million, first of all. You know, and so all the all that the conservancy wanted was for the city to make sure that that park was kept up, right? So if I buy you a house and all I say is you, I want you to pay for the utilities, I just want to make sure you right. pay for the utilities and don't pay for a party. And this is what the conservancy wanted. And that's where the city and the conservancy, you know, got sideways. Uh, you know, I, I, I think something could be done there, but you know, it's very unfortunate that that $40 million of charity was turned down for a city that doesn't have it. And, um, you know, that just kind of ties to the to the nature of of Midland. But but at the end of the day, the, the average age, I'm older than the average age in Midland now. Right. Average age is 32. Wow. So, you know, I think the 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 silent majority in Midland needs to kind of wake up and, and push these city council leaders and the, and the city leaders to say, hey, I've got a two-year-old and a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and I work at Diamondback, and I want to work there for the next 15 years, but we better get some investment in the community or, you know, companies like Diamondback have left this city for the last 10 years, and we've st stuck around. So we're it's, our, it's on us to keep pushing things forward, and as we've gotten bigger, we've donated more to the city, to the local charities, but it's got to be a two-way street. Yeah. I feel that I got a buddy that's running for city council and, uh, in Edmond where I live, which is just North of OKC. And I'm happy that he's doing it. He's a great guy cares about the community, but you need people like that that can come in and, and be the positive change and bring the rational arguments and, uh, and do what needs to be done. And I think at the community level, I'm uh, way more liberal when it comes to the community, because that's where you live. That's where you, your kids play. Um, right. at, at the national level, I'm more conservative, but, uh, but certainly at the community level, I think there's a, and you know, a chance to give back, especially with companies like yours that are driving so much economic activity and, right. and have the ability to do, to do those things. So anyways, I think that it's important that you're talking out about yeah, it. It's, and, um, it's just but, tough. It's like one, one in 20 barrels of oil in the world is produced within 150 miles of here. Wow. You know, and Midland is no Dubai. I'll tell you that, but like, come on, right. like, you, we could at least put some money, some of that money back into the community to make this, you know, a better place to, to raise a family, educate kids and, um, you know, and grow the economy. Yeah, that's good. What about a uh, last set of questions here for getting the top of the hour? What about Twitter getting on there, being more public? When did you get involved with that community? There's clearly a lot of oil and gas people and energy people broadly um, on the platform, but when did you start? Have you been on it for a long time? I haven't even looked at your profile, but when did you get involved? I, at all with the I got, community? I got on it. I got on it in 2012 or 20, no, when I was playing tennis, like 2008, but that was early, right? I tweeted like once and then I yeah. never looked at Twitter again until, I don't know. I'd like to think 2018 ish, <clears throat> you yeah. know, it was kind of the beginning of the, of the shell was kind of, going through, you know, death cycle number two or number three, whatever one it was at the time. Right. Right. And, um, you know, you, you started to see, uh, some pushback on, on companies and the business. And, you know, I, I decided, uh, at the time, you know, I was, I wasn't in the position I am now, but uh, I decided to, you know, be myself on there. I think, you know, like you, this is how our generation communicates. Um, I think Twitter, is a great source of information. There's a lot of smart people on Twitter. Um, I think sometimes maybe, you know, a little too many anons getting a little too aggressive, but yeah. at the end of the day, you know, it's a, at the end of the day, it's, it's a communication tool. Um, I think this generation of, you know, next level leaders in our sector um, are going to find new ways to communicate versus the, you know, what, what has been a unfortunate perception of what, leadership looks like in the industry. So kind of yeah. try to make things more relatable. And, and, you know, when, when people have problems, that's fine. People are happy. That's fine. And, and it's just a, a good way to communicate in my mind. It is. And I think like it gives, you can be like an authentic version of yourself and try to give some more, you know, be a little bit more personable and show people who you are 
And, you know, for better, or for worse, not everybody's going to like your, you know, if you're putting out takes on Twitter, not everybody's going to like it, but there's a level of like showing people that authenticity of, you know, you being a real person, you know, putting yourself out there. I think historically the oil and gas industry, especially at the C-suite is in my opinion, been viewed as kind of stuffy, kind of old school. Yeah. Um, We're not robots. That's, that's you know? changing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we got to like, you got to embrace it. Like, and, and, you know, fortunately, you know, I work for a guy who's, who is of a different generation, but understands that, um, this is how our generation <laughs> communicates and, um, you know, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. Last thing on just communication as an industry as a whole, uh, just your thoughts on what we could do better. How do we change the public's perspective? I know that's a loaded question to end on, but just, uh, is it conversations like these or just what else? I mean, I think, I think we could do better. I yeah, I think about that a lot. I think about why our industry, you know, just takes the inbounds and doesn't dish it back, um, mm. which is frustrating. I think it, it comes down to, you know, this is an industry that is vital to the global economy. And it's also an industry where we've never marketed ourselves. Um, we're not a, 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 a suite of marketing geniuses. Uh, we're a lot of engineers and a lot of smart people, but they're not, we're not marketers, right? Every barrel and every gas molecule we, we produce every day gets sold without any marketing. And, um, you know, that narrative has, has uh, we've always said we've lost the narrative, but okay, well, we've, had, we've lost the narrative for the whole 10 years I've worked in the sector. So how do we change that a little bit? I mean, this, stuff like this and, and talking on Twitter and being yourself on Twitter helps, but, you know, we need to not be talking into an echo chamber, in my opinion. There, there's too much of, um, you know, our trade groups and our, our peers talking to each other about, hey, that's so stupid. Well, okay, well, let's try to talk to the other side and have a rational conversation um, if it's if it's there to be had. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, so I'm just easier said than done, your, though, right? <laughs> it is easier said than done. I've had to try, I've tried to have people on uh, from the other side on and uh, it, you know, actually people are pretty civil when you get them in a face to face or, you know, a one on one type setting. I think people can agree on a lot more versus sometimes in Twitter, it's all hyperbolic and outrage. So, um, right. so I think, I think it's important, but case I'll respect your time here. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.